The white powder will pull you under faster than you can imagine, and the high you feel as it does so can elicit feelings of terror and awe, horror and beauty. When you step away from the steep slope, all you can think about is it. How it lays so perfectly wherever it is placed and how badly you need the high that you get from the ride it takes you on. It is bliss, and if you are not careful, it will destroy you and leave those standing with bowed heads at your funeral wondering if there was anything more they could have done. Meth and Mammoth Mountain One white powder crystallizes in your blood, and the other quietly sinks her cold fangs into you until your body is as solid as ice. Welcome back to Tragedy with a View. I am your host, Kayla, and welcome to our free solo Friday episode where I venture out on my own without a co-host and provide you with a short story to be enjoyed while you're waiting on episodes I co-host with my friends. Just a real quick little bit of housekeeping in the few... In the next few weeks, you are going to start seeing a new look, and that is because I worked with Cindy Roaming Designs to create a bit more of a foundation for the brand that I am hoping to build here, and she did a fantastic job. Patreon members, no matter what tier you are in, you are going to see everything first. Speaking of Patreon, and I want to shout out my internet friends, Megan and Danielle, the hosts of Off the Trail podcast, who they have a very similar podcast. You should absolutely go check them out. They have a $1 Patreon tier. And I thought that this is just such a good idea because it really is such a simple way to support the creators that you love and help them do what they do. And trust me, that is appreciated. So I also now have a $1 tier. On to the story. Mammoth Mountain Ski Resort is located, of course, in Mammoth Lakes, California, and it is inside of Inyo National Forest in the eastern Sierra Nevadas. While many believe that the name Mammoth was inspired by the sheer size of the mountain, the name actually derives from the Mammoth Mining Company, who in 1870 hoped to find gold in the area and therefore would hold a mammoth amount of value. The area was void of gold, but the name hung on. Mammoth Mountain is the highest ski resort in the country, with a lift that takes you to the top of the mountain at 11,053 feet in elevation, or 3,369 meters. It is considered a year-round recreation resort that has long winters, and we talked a little bit about this area in a prior episode that we did on Alpine Meadows and an avalanche that occurred there. Alpine Meadows is about three and a half hours north of Mammoth Mountain, and Mammoth Mountain, just like Alpine Meadows, sits in this ridge that just gets dumped on with snow. With the average of 400 inches of snow per year, you may be surprised to learn that this mountain is actually a volcanic vent, with its last eruption being somewhere around 700 years ago. This eruption occurred on the north side of the mountain, and there has been some symptoms of unrest recently with gas emissions and trees dying off. And this, along with more recent earthquakes and ground lifting at an unusual rate, the USGS management system has special sensors in place to allow for better tracking of these symptoms and to help determine if there are any real hazards in this area. There are still 35 vents that are around the mountain that are part of the same magmatic line that runs through the Sierra Nevadas, and eruptions occurred in the Mammoth Mountain area from 100,000 years ago to 50,000 years ago. Because of the height and the location and large amount of snow, 
Mammoth Mountain is known to have some of the best routes for skiing and snowboarding in the entire country. Mammoth also gets a lot of sunshine, so not only is it great for skiing and snowboarding, but it is just a happy place to be for anyone. Ski season starts with the lifts beginning to operate in November and often run into the month of June. The resort has four lodges, 150 trails that are regularly used, with others that are seldom used, and 3,500 acres of skiable area. Eric Lamarck was born in Paris but grew up in Pacific Palisades, which is near Los Angeles, California. Because you have automatic citizenship of the country you are born in, he held dual citizenship with both the United States and France, and when his athletic skills allowed him to be at ease on the ice, hockey became his obsession. In 1987, at 17 years old, he was drafted to join the Boston Bruins, and he was able to represent France in the 1994 Olympics when he was 24. But his independence and lack of maturity would start to feed his ego and aggression, and soon he found himself without a team. While Eric had a natural talent on the ice, he never worked very hard on his skill set. Eric was not the only extremely athletic person in his family, and they believe that his grandfather, who was a Golden Glove fighter, passed down his genes to Eric. Eric, while extremely talented on the ice, was not the biggest guy, and because of this, he wasn't very physically confrontational, and if you know anything about ice hockey, you know that they are known for their fights. Because of this, the NHL didn't really have a lot of interest in him as a player, but still, Eric would work hard to maintain what skills he did have and he would be on the ice six days a week and shoot about 500 shots of the puck a day. And just to clarify, I think what is meant when he claims that he never worked very hard on his skills is that he didn't spend time to identify weaknesses and then specifically work on those. He just kind of, you know, did what he had always done, and that was good enough to get him by. Without a consistent team... Eric would jump from place to place for the next couple of years, first playing roller hockey with the Los Angeles Blades and then playing on ice in both France and Germany. But his demeanor would strike again and Eric would find himself again without a team. But this time there was more happening behind the scenes. Eric had also began using meth, also known as speed. Isolating himself from friends and family, it took about 10 years, but Eric finally took up snowboarding and fell in love. And just like with hockey and with meth, he was all in, spending every moment he could focusing on snowboarding, and just like with hockey, his athletic capacity gave him a ton of talent right off the bat. His focus quickly turned to the X Games, and in February 2004, Eric, now 34 years old, and a few friends went to Mammoth Mountain to work on the required skills to succeed in a competition like the X Games. Just like with hockey, Eric threw himself into getting as good as he could and was snowboarding 200 or more days each year. Eric, while his focus was on competing, he also was getting into some trouble. When he left for this trip, he was waiting on a court date because he had been caught trespassing and was also charged with possession of drugs. On February 6th, the day was nice and calm, so all he wore for warmth was a light jacket, and this jacket he had actually removed the lining of so that way he would be able to move better while out on the slopes. But before long, a storm began to move in and ski patrol stepped in and started closing down the mountain. And they did this by first starting to close down the lifts so that way people couldn't get on. And then they were also physically coming down the mountain and telling everyone in their path that there was a storm coming and they highly recommended that they leave the area now. 
Eric had been with friends in this moment, and while they decided to leave and go take and go have a few drinks and jump in the hot tub, Eric was extremely confident, and he felt that he had the time for one more run and decided to go up to the top of the mountain alone. The ridge that he came to is known as Dragon's Back, and it leads to some really untouched backcountry, which is exactly what Eric was looking for. Once there, he ducked under the line that separated the resort from the backcountry, and this particular route had a turnoff point that would bring you back around the front side of the mountain and back within resort bounds. But About halfway down the mountainside, Eric ran face first into a thick cloud of fog and mist, and it completely obliterated his ability to see and therefore navigate. As he tried to make his way down the mountain by feel and memory, he missed the turnoff and became lost. As day turned into night, Eric realized that he was in fact truly lost and had no idea where to go and that people likely weren't searching for him yet. So he came up with a quick game plan. He would wait out the night under a tree and start walking back the following morning when he could see where he was going. In the pockets of his jacket, he carried a radio MP3 player, a couple sticks of gum, matches that had gotten wet and were therefore useless, and a bag of meth. From what he guessed, he was about one and a half miles away from the Tamarack Lodge and figured he would be able to get there the following day and then this nightmare would be over. He spent the night wide awake and shivering against the cold. When dawn broke through and lit up the sky and his surroundings, Eric got moving, but very quickly found movement to be difficult as he was trying to break ground through 13 feet of snow. Then he caught some movement up ahead of him, and in his slight bit of a delusional state, when he realized that these were coyotes, he first thought them to be wolves and suddenly feared that they would be able to smell his gum in his pocket and would start to stalk and kill him like prey, so he threw the gum away from him. He then walked a little ways and then heard the sound of running water. Since he didn't have water with him, he decided to follow the sound so that way he could get a drink, and then he decided that he was going to follow the river down the mountain. This river is the San Joaquin River, and it takes you deep into the Ansel Adams Wilderness. Depending on the source, one of a few things happened next. One, and I think this is probably the most likely option, is that he got down on his belly and what he thought was a ledge was actually just a loose, unsupported cornice of snow, which then gave way into the river under his weight. Another source states that Eric was following the river, but instead of walking beside it, he was hopping from rock to rock along the edge and in the river, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me with him carrying his snowboard with him, That seems like it would kind of limit his ability to jump side to side, but I I can't say that for sure. No matter, somehow, Eric ended up falling into the water, and while he was in no danger of being swept away and he was easily able to climb out of the river, the unfortunate side is that he was now soaked with freezing cold water. In an attempt to dry his clothes and keep himself warm, he stripped down and laid out his clothing on boulders that were in the sun and then moved around and jumped around and found a little place to take shelter from the wind to try to keep himself warm. Unfortunately, the sun did not do a very good job of drying his clothing, so he had to put those cold, wet clothes back on. And it was here that he noticed one of his feet was already frozen and swelling bad enough that he could not get one of his boots onto that foot. Because of this, he did not travel very far on the second day and would endure a second night on the Mountains of Mammoth. That night, he found a ledge that he could kind of curl up inside of, and this time he did sleep. 
When he woke up, he realized that his poor situation had taken a turn for the worse as his feet were now completely numb. Somehow he used every bit of grit and determination within his body and managed to travel about seven miles on this third day of being lost in the wilderness. He made a deal with himself that he could take 10 steps and then rest for a bit. This, though, got him to climb nearly 1,200 feet or 365 meters up Pumice Butte. But again, this bad situation took a turn for the worse, and he moved in the wrong direction and deeper into wilderness rather than toward the resort. Being in the disoriented state he was in, he had no idea that he was just walking in circles, which meant that he wasn't really going anywhere anymore. He started to become desperate, and I'm sorry, this next sentence is graphic, but he was so hungry that when he pulled one of the socks off of his feet and noticed dead skin came off of his foot with the sock, he decided to eat that dead skin. Surprisingly, to me at least, because I know how hard addiction can be, especially in a state of withdrawal, he decided to dump out his baggie of meth, which in a desperate cry to consume more calories, he would start to eat bark and pine needles And in an effort to stay a little bit warmer, he stuffed his arm sleeves and around his torso with twigs and leaves. After this, his movement became much more difficult. And instead of walking, he was trying to use his snowboard to help him maneuver. But he realized that he had just gone the wrong direction and he needed to make his way back up and over the ridge that he was certain would take him back to the resort. It was his fifth day in the wilderness when his mom started to get really worried because he was not returning any of her phone calls, and he had been supposed to return home by this point. She expressed her concerns to her husband, Eric's dad, and he echoed it back. Eric's dad would drive to Mammoth Mountain and report his son missing, and authorities would waste no time launching a search and rescue as when they checked in with the resort and with the condo he had been staying in, no one had seen him since the storm arrived on the mountain. The Mono County search and rescue teams immediately launched a search for Eric. Teams on foot and in the air and on snowmobiles were searching for him, and this was partially done because Eric was now one of three lost in this area. Eric, by this point, had dug out a small snow cave with his snowboard and his hands, and he was just kind of hanging out in this place trying to figure out what to do, and he would end up spending two nights and three days in the snow cave. He did, though, figure out his next plan of action. After resting a bit, he took out his MP3 player, and when he turned it on, he noticed that he had a better signal when he pointed it in a certain direction. This, he thought, must lead him towards the resort. On February 13th, his eighth day of being missing, a helicopter, which was searching for him, spotted what they thought might be Eric and relayed the location to a ground crew to check on the area. Meanwhile, Eric was having a really hard time staying awake, and he realized for the first time that he was very close to death, and that one of these times he was going to doze off and not wake up. The ground crew who responded to the location that the helicopter sent in would arrive to find a very lethargic but alive Eric. His body temperature had plummeted to 86 degrees Fahrenheit meaning that he was hypothermic, delusional, and he had lost 40 pounds over the last eight days. Once in the hospital, he was treated for a severe gangrene infection and had a dangerously high fever of 107 degrees Fahrenheit. Unfortunately, Eric's feet were in bad condition, with his left foot being worse than his right but ultimately, they were both dead and they would need to be amputated. 
He first had one surgery to remove the dead parts of his feet with the cut line being just below his ankles. And then he would later undergo a second surgery when he was a bit more recovered and better suited to undergo the surgery to remove more of his legs. And this one would remove the lower part of his legs six inches below the knees And this was to create a better foundation to fit prosthetic limbs. In addition to dealing with the emotional turmoil brought on by losing his feet, he also swore off drugs and as his body healed, he then had to come off of painkillers as well. But he has not touched drugs since. To cope, Eric finally asked for help and had such a positive experience that he decided to take a role in helping others cope and step away from addiction by working with Vogue Recovery Centers, where he really embodies that sometimes the way to move up is first to hit rock bottom. Eric learned how to do simple daily tasks without his feet and now mentions that if he wakes up in the middle of the night needing to use the bathroom, he had to get out of bed and crawl instead of going through the process of putting on his prosthetics. Eric would write a book about his ordeal, and later a movie would be made, both of which are called Six Below, Miracle on the Mountain. During the process of making the movie, Eric attended many of the filming sessions, and while much of it was hard for him to relive in a way, Watching the scenes where he lost his legs was so difficult that he left the filming area. As someone whose legs and feet led him to greatness, and as someone who was also very athletic, it's hard to process life after the loss of something that led you to so much good and really just became who you are. His legs and feet allowed him to play hockey, which had him traveling the world and It was a source of income and community. This also set him up for the building blocks needed to lead a successful life. Your legs become a part of your identity, and he admits that he struggled greatly with who he was after his legs were removed. Yet, he was determined to get back on the mountain, and one year later, that is exactly what he did. Thank you all for listening. I hope you have a great weekend or a week, depending on when you're listening to this. Don't forget to join us on Patreon or Apple subscription for April's exclusive episodes, and we will see you next time. Thank you for listening. Please take a moment to rate and subscribe from wherever you listen to Tragedy with a View. To get access to ad-free episodes, bonus content, and more, please join us on our Patreon The link will be in the show notes. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram and Facebook. And to share a story of your own, send us a campfire confessional email at tragedywithaview at gmail.com. We'll see you next time.